Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's, uh, tonight's event. <laughs> My name is Robert Levitt, and I'm the acting dean of the Daniels faculty. And as you know, this is the first day of Black History, Black Futures Month. Uh, and our lecture this evening by architect and educator Jermaine Barnes kicks off the faculty's month-long uh, celebration of black achievement, past and present, in architecture and design. We'll be marking this month uh, with a host of dedicated programming, uh, including two public lectures exploring black identity and the built environment, a student art installation offering diverse interpretations of black flourishing, and a display in the Eberhard Zeidler Library of Books and other resources devoted to black figures and influences in architecture and related fields. Uh, and I'll expand a little bit more on that at the end of the evening. Um, but before we continue, uh, I'd like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, today, this meeting will, uh, today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and uh, we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. As many of you may know, the, uh, the name of the avenue in which our faculty sits, Spadina, comes from the Ashanabi word Ishpadina and means a place on the hill. The site was also part of an important trail for several First Nations. And as an institution committed to promoting truth and reconciliation, we note this history and wish to honor these connections as we move forward collectively. Uh, and now for this evening's presentation. Our guest speaker, Jeremy Barnes is currently an associate professor at the, and the director of the Community Housing Identity Lab, known as CHILL, at the University of Miami School of Architecture. He is also the founder of Studio Barnes, an award-winning research and design practice that investigates the connection between architecture and identity. In particular, Jermaine mines, mines the social and political agency of architecture through historical research and design speculation to examine how the built environment influences such issues as black domesticity and community. In 2021, Jermaine was awarded both the Harvard GSD Wheelwright Prize and the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers. And he was the 2021-22 uh, Rome Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Rome. Um, and Jermaine's work has been exhibited uh, in the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, uh, in their groundbreaking 2020 exhibition, Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, as well as in the 2021 Chicago Architectural Biennale, um, Architectural Biennale, Biennale. Last year, Studio Barnes' installation, Grio, a meditation on the legacies that are hidden in our foundational architectural canon was, fe was featured at the Venice um, Architectural Biennale. So, in tonight's lecture, which will be followed by a question and answer session, Jermaine will explore the themes of community-oriented design, the expression of architectural representation, and the idea of alternative design authorship. So please help me in welcoming Jermaine Barnes to the stage. Right on cue, it goes back to the screensaver. All right, we got action. Hi everyone, thank you all for giving me your Thursday evening. Um, the projects we're gonna be talking about today uh, may not seem to have a connecting thread because they're in various countries, they're in various venues, they have various scales, but all of them deal with storytelling. Every single one of the projects that we'll be presenting tonight <clears throat> will be ones that try to express something about the city. So, let's see if this works. There you go. So, I heard you were looking for me. This is actually the lyric to a Lil Wayne song. Um, <laughs> it's him and Jay-Z, and you know, if you know the song, you know the song. Uh, I have this, I have this thing where I always try to label a talk based off of a favorite song of mine or a line of mine, something like that, but it seemed appropriate <clears throat> because my approach to architecture 
as one that's always looking for stories that have either been reappropriated or ignored or just completely absent from the discipline and from the profession. So I want to start with the term griot. Uh, it is a West African term, and it essentially is a person that keeps the stories. And so I try to find ways to make design objects, architecture, the keeper of stories. How are we able to disseminate the narratives of people and places if there's no one there to speak on their behalf? In my family, the griot was my grandmother. She had every single obituary, I feel like, in the history of our entire family. And it's just one of those things where it's typically the matriarch um, in many families that are from the African diaspora. Uh, and so I wanted to use it as inspiration into the way that we do our work. So we're gonna start with the MoMA project, um, A Spectrum of Blackness. And again, we're talking about storytelling here. And so this is the brief that they gave us when we were invited to be within the show. Now, the unfortunate thing about the show is that MoMA has one of the oldest architecture departments in the entire United States of America. They had never had an all black architecture exhibition in the history of the department. And so it wasn't until 2021 that they finally decided to have a show that featured only black designers, black architects and visual artists. And they gave us this brief that said, pick a city or a site, pick a space, pick a scale. And you'll notice that a lot of these are seen as distinctly black cities. So this is post George Floyd, hence why Ferguson um, is on the list. But you'll notice the absence of Miami, Florida. And it's because oftentimes people don't see Miami as a black city. But a lot of people don't understand that Miami does not exist if it was not for the Bahamian community that helped plan the city and helped build the city. Because when it was time to go through voting for incorporation, they temporarily gave black males the ability to vote so that the city could be incorporated and then rescinded that ability once the vote passed. So with this type of history, I asked the curatorial team, can I please pick Miami be my point of departure to which they allowed. And so the spaces I chose were ritual and play and liberation. And then the scales and types I chose was the kitchen, the porch, and water. So I want to start with this map. This is a historic map of Miami. All of these pockets are the locations where black people were allowed to live in the city. So you have many people who are from water. They're from the coast, they're from the Caribbean, and when they come build the city, they're told you are not allowed to live by the water. Instead, you have to live inland. The ironic thing is with sea level rise and climate change, the sites that are actually above sea level are these sites. And so now all the rich people who were on the beach have come back and start taking the land that they forced all these people to live in. We call that climate gentrification. And so I enjoy showing this image because to reinforce how black people were not allowed to be on the beach, you had to literally have a racial identification card. So think about your regular ID or your passport or your library card or your student ID. You also had to have this card because without it, you were not allowed onto Miami Beach. And often the only people that had this card are those that worked in the labor force your housekeepers, your cleaners, the people who we discard and we treat as if they're not that important. And so if you've ever seen the movie One Night in Miami with uh, Malcolm X and um, Muhammad Ali and they're staying at the historic Hampton House in Brownsville in Miami, that's because even if you are a world-renowned heavyweight champion of the world, probably one of the three most famous people in the entire globe, he was still black and he wasn't allowed to stay on the beach. And so what I started to do was mine the histories and the stories of people that are from different diasporic ethnicities in Miami. Because as you can see, I am a black person. In Miami, the first question I would always get is, where are you from? And I say, Chicago. And they say, no, like, where are you 
Where are you from? The west side of Chicago. And they ask again, they're like, where is your family from? I'm like, I just told you, I was born and raised on the west side of Chicago. If you're asking about my mother, she's from Arkansas. You're asking about my dad, his family's from Mississippi. You ask me beyond that, it was a boat. They weren't happy about being on that boat. I don't, I don't know anything beyond that. But what they're really trying to place is they're trying to figure out what is your point of, what is your heritage in Miami because you can look like me and be Bahamian, Bayesian, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican, Honduran. And so this type of ethnic diversity clearly shows that Miami is a distinctly black city, but not one that is monolithic. But the things that they do share in common oftentimes is the way that they occupy space, or my favorite, the things that they cook with. So we went around to all of the ethnic groups, Jamaicans, Haitians, Trinidadians, and we asked them all, what do you cook with? What does the porch mean to you? And then we made all of these collages that synthesize all of those narratives. And so these were two of my favorites. Far left was again going back to the idea of the racial identification card and who was allowed on the beach and who was not allowed on the beach. And the one on the right is the sort of ubiquitous little black girl getting her hair done in the kitchen and she's tender headed and her mom doesn't care. And having four older sisters, I've seen that face a whole lot of times. And you just sit there and you're like, come on, Ma, like, can you, can you make the brain just a little more loose? Like, clearly it hurts, but it's like, I guess beauty is pain, so <laughs> good luck with that. And then separate, we made this exploded spice rack. And so my approach was, how can I make things in the show that you don't need an architecture degree to understand? Because ultimately, we all operate within space in some sort of way, and so I felt the work needed to be accessible to all without an architecture, urbanism, or urban planning background. And so we came up with this exploded axon, which is basically a massive spice rack. So if there's any students in the crowd, you all might make exploded axons as a 2D drawing. We made one in real life in 3D to scale. And so you begin to see how the actual spices and the jars all reinforce the stripe that's on the wall itself. And so we designed everything, even all the way down to the labels on the jars. And so each one of those has a cheeky little statement on them as well. So like, for example, on the African-American row, there's uh, a bunch of Lowry season salt, and it says, we put this shit on everything. And then there's another one that's filled with hot sauce, and it says, yes, hot sauce is a spice. And then there's another one that says paprika, and it says, your eggs aren't deviled without a sprinkle of this on top of it. And then what really ended up happening is you saw a bunch of people that were able to have conversations about their shared background. You start to realize that star anise is something they use in Southeast Asia as well as in the Caribbean. You start to see how curry powder is found in Trinidadian cuisine and also in Indian cuisine. And so it became this point of conversation to show how lineage and migration are all relevant and all shown through food. And so when we finished this project, we were very excited about the fact that people were able to understand what it means to be black, but also to have different types of ethnicities within that blackness. So when that project finished, uh, Chicago happened. And again, I am from Chicago. I'm a proud Chicagoan. It's kind of why I like Toronto. It makes me feel like I'm actually in Chicago, even all the way down to how cold it is and the fact that your Toronto Raptors use the exact same color palette as my Chicago Bulls. <laughs> and so this is a project that was happening during the 2021 Chicago Biennial. It was curated by David Brown, who's an architect and urbanist based in Chicago. And his research is rooted in the available city. The fact that there are so many empty lots across Chicago that they could be their own city if you, if you put them all together. And so he approached me and said, Jermaine, I'd love you to be one of the participants in the biennial. I have two sites for you. There's one on the south side, one on the west side. Which one would you like? Can you guess which one I picked? West side is the best side. You're not getting me to go out south to do my work for them. It's not happening. So I picked this spot on the west side of Chicago, and the name of the neighborhood is North Lawndale. The other really cool thing is there's a movie theater that's maybe four minutes away, and that's a movie theater I visited as a kid quite often. So it really was like a homecoming for me. 
and there's this empty lot with a basketball court right there. And so we came up with this idea of a block party. I'm not sure if block parties are a thing in Toronto, but they really are a thing in the States, and specifically Chicago. And in my opinion, it's one of the best acts of guerrilla urbanism that you will ever find, because the neighborhood just takes their cars, they park them at the end of the block, they don't have permits, they don't ask for permission. They just say, we're gonna take over the city, and every single house on the block is gonna provide some sort of resource to the kids before they go back to school. So one house gets backpacks, another house gets notebooks, another house gets folders, another house gets markers. And before you know it, you have an entire community that have looked out for each other. Again, without any rules. And so we figured, what if we took the ubiquitous bounce house that is at every single block party? Because it's not a, par a block party without the pink bounce house. And then combine that with like, Bernard Shumi's Park the Lavalet. And so this is where this actual playscape comes from. And so we took the block as a module, it's a two by two piece of wood, and then we began to aggregate, twist, and flip, and rotate, and cut, and we came up with this. It's also right next to the pink line, so the pink made sense. Um, and I also like, just like bright colors. I know I'm wearing all black right now, because that's what architects wear and I wanted you all to take me seriously. But if you catch me outside of this, like the students who were hanging with me yesterday, I had on green and I had on blue jeans and stuff, right? So, you know, you gotta fit the part. And one of the cool things about this and the work that the way that our approach worked is that every month I would fly to Chicago, one, to see my family, but also to work with neighborhood high school kids as we began to do sort of architectural engineering workshops over the course of the block party. In the end, this is the actual structure, and that's the pink line in the background. And then we threw a block party, because you literally can't have a block party without throwing a block party. So all the food was bought from a local place two blocks away. We hosted a workshop at the local barbershop a block away. The DJ lived at the house on the corner. Everything stayed within a three block radius this entire project. And so these are all the kids that were playing on the structure. That's actually my nephew. And can't you tell these are architects? <laughs> and because they're architects, they wanted to test the load capacity of the structure. <laughs> Hence why there's so many people on the actual structure itself. And so once we finished this, um, I was approached by a festival in Laronio, Spain, and that festival is called Concentrico. Right now, they're in their 10th edition, and they asked me if I would like to participate because they saw the work that was in the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, and I said, absolutely, a free excuse to go to Spain? I'll take it, like, let's go. And we came up with this idea of Intersect, which is really about the city being a place for play, being a place that's a theater. And so we picked this little plaza here out in Laronio. Laronio is about uh, three or four hours east of Bilbao. So you fly into Bilbao and you hop on a bus and you go all the way out into the countryside. They're known for their wine and for the fact that the city basically stops at three or four p.m. and that's when you start drinking wine. And so we picked this little plaza here, this little intersection, and the idea is you can sit and watch a performance, the city, you can receive flowers at the end of that performance landscape. And then we have curtains that actually open and show us what's happening within the cityscape. So this was a rendering of what it would be like. Sort of isometric view. And this is them fabricating the structure. And this is it as it's being installed and you can see at the end of the performance, you get, a, you get a bouquet of roses, there's seating, and these are the curtains. And wouldn't you know it, tons of people came out, tons of people sat in the space, kids loved it. I'll tell you all a secret, this is to you future architects, if you make stuff for kids, they have to bring their parents. <laughs> so that's the quickest way to get your spaces to seem like they're always filled. Design them, for the younger version of you, and then they'll bring their parents, and then you have a packed project all the time. 
and then you see them playing with the structure. And again, just trying to reinforce that the whole purpose, in my opinion, of the city is for it to be open to everyone. Like this idea of no loitering is absurd to me. Like we should be allowed to occupy and exist in public space. And when we talk about public space, it's impossible to talk about it without talking about cars, unfortunately. Because we're in an era where either everyone drives a car, has a car, or car-centric culture has absolutely obliterated your neighborhood. So Lexus also saw the stuff that was in Chicago, and they have an annual competition where they select a few promising designers, and they ask you to do a proposal for Miami Art Week, which is always the first week of December. You guys might know it as Art Basel, but the actual name is Miami Art Week. And I told them, you know, if you pick me, I'm gonna talk about how highways have obliterated black neighborhoods. So are you sure you want me to be the designer that's gonna represent you here in your fancy new car? And they foolishly said yes. So <laughs> afterwards, I showed them this. This is Miami. This used to be called Good Bread Alley, and then called Colored Town, and then called Overtown. And Overtown is a historically black neighborhood that then the I-95, 195, 395 exchange completely destroyed. No different than many other cities like Detroit, Oakland, Philadelphia, all these places have highways that always obliterate black neighborhoods. In addition to that, Miami also have these things called segregation walls. Segregation wall literally meaning what it sounds like. Let's just make a corridor right down the street, black people on one side, white people on the other side, and we will not build any housing for black people unless they erected a 14 foot tall wall. And again, how do I talk about cars without talking about public interventions like this? This is the remnants of the wall. So imagine this, let's say we use the stage as an example, where you all are sitting is the lower elevation that's there and where I am now is the side where the white people live. And that wall used to stand about 13 feet tall before they knocked it down. And Miami is a place that's water vulnerable, so you're already below sea level. So the fact that this exists shows how much they didn't care. Fun fact though, this is where they filmed the movie Moonlight that won the Academy Award a few years ago. This is literally the site of what happened. This is where Terrell was actually born and raised. Uh, Terrell McCraney is the playwright that wrote Black Boys Go Blue in the Moonlight. So um, fun fact that's next to a very terrible and contested history. So with all of this, um, I had to come up with this idea of an electric car that's jumping into the future and that's bright and colorful and that will make everybody very happy. And so we came up with that. And so this is actually a one-to-one -one scale version of their car, which is an electric car. And because we live in the age of social media, the first thing the comms team, communications team said to me is, what do we have that's Instagrammable? And so that's why the swing exists. Literally the only reason. It has nothing to do with the car whatsoever. But you needed something for people to sit on that lights up so that everybody has their phone not to take a selfie. I kid you not, every single day there was a line of about 100 people trying to get a selfie on that damn thing. But it had nothing to do with the car. The actual purpose of the car was, again, if I'm going to talk about car culture and how to obliterate back cities, I didn't feel right putting the actual car in the show. But it kind of defeats the purpose for Lexus. They're like, wait a minute, if you're not going to put the car in the show, why are we hiring you? So I said, don't worry about it. I have an idea. It's going to be the car. It just won't be the car the way you think about it. And then when I showed them the wireframe from Rhino, they were like, I don't get it. And I was like, you just got to trust me here. If you trust me, it'll happen. And so we sent them samples and pictures of what it would look like. And in the end, when it came to this, they were blown away. So blown away that once they saw the swing set, they really lost their minds. <laughs> and they asked for a second swing set. So they ended up being another one on the opposite side. And then they liked it so much, they shifted to Tokyo. So this is it in another gallery space with all of the mirrors to give it an infinity look. And then they sent it to Milan. I don't know where this car is now, but I'll never see it again. But Lexus seems to love it. 
and it gave us the opportunity to also design some furniture as well. Um, I'm from Chicago. I went to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Like, screw that school. That's where I went, but whatever. Um, but my professors were from an era where architects designed everything all the way down to the doorknob. Like, we have these design skills. Why don't we use them as much as we did in the past? And so I felt like, why don't we also design the furniture that the people will sit on as they're there observing the thing? So we actually designed all of this furniture and tables as well in the vein of sort of uh, a nod to Miami modernism of concrete and wood construction. And so that was an ode to that. And even though you guys have seen zero architecture to this point, I actually do architecture too. So this project is in Delray Beach, Florida. Delray is in Palm Beach County. It's a little bit south of West Palm, um, maybe an hour north of Miami. And there's this amazing community group named Thrive. And it's uh, two women who are extremely passionate about preserving community, not in like the historical preservation, I wanna do a bunch of paperwork type of way, but how do I empower people who live in their community to keep their neighborhood to themselves? So this is a site map of Delray Beach, specifically St. Matthew's Church. Uh, this is called The Set. And at one point in time, it was a sundown town. Does everyone in here know what a sundown town is? Does anyone not know what a sundown town is? Okay, so sundown towns are a thing in the United States of America where literally when the sun would set, if you were a person of color, specifically a black person or maybe a Mexican person, you could be killed by anyone and nobody would do anything about it. Let me say that again. If you look like me, just existing in public space could get you kidnapped, abducted, murdered, and no one would care about it. So the idea was when the sun is up, you're fine. When that sun goes down, you better be somewhere safe. And so that's actually where this idea of the Green Book came from. It was this way of people who actually are allies and try to save and preserve life would have these different hotel rooms or homes that they would protect people so that when they drive through certain neighborhoods or take certain ways, they actually would make it there safely and they'd be alive when they finished their, their, uh, their trip. And so as a result, many neighborhoods like this, and just to let you all know, sundown towns still exist in the United States. They're not on maps. You hear them, people tell you like word of mouth, but there are certain areas in the states where, again, if you look like me, you do not drive through them at nighttime because you may not make it home. And so uh, Thrive was able to work with some local churches that own these parcels here and have asked us to help them redistribute these parcels and do some new work with the building stock that they have. So you can see these are all the structures that this church owns. In this area, the largest land owner actually is three churches, Community Primitive, St. Matthew's, and Ebenezer Wesleyan. And so we propose consolidating some of these sites into bigger sites. Uh, in the future, some of these will actually be the site of future housing. But in the interim, we're turning the parish hall into a commercial kitchen and community space. And so this is the existing parish hall, very nondescript, very simple gable roof, not much special about it. But it's to the people in the community, it's extremely special. It's where they host baby showers, it's where they have community events, is where they have repasses after unfortunate passing, is where they have their annual Christmas event. And so this is what the existing plan looks like. And we're proposing this massive slice here on the side that sort of creates an interior port, or an exterior porch. And we're pushing out the front of the building to create a new storefront that's there. And this is the commercial kitchen space. And so just sort of show them how we can manipulate this into different types of things, wedding receptions, workspaces. And that's what it's gonna look like. So we're changing the storefront. This is the overhang over here that now we've created this porch that exists. These actual trusses already exist inside of the building. They're just covered up by an ugly drop ceiling. So we're just removing the drop ceiling, we're adding some fireproofing, we're changing the mechanical systems. The terrazzo floor also already exists. The building has some very nice components, but everything else around it is just not that impressive. Um, so we're gonna come up with some custom furniture as well. This is just placeholder rendering stuff. 
but this is one component of the project. We're in construction documents right now. We're about 10 per, about 15% into design development. And then across the street at Ebenezer Wesleyan, this is their church, they have a massive parcel here. And so we propose the Bahamian market because one of the things we wanna have is economic sustainability. And so the first thing we heard from the constituents of the church and those constituents are elderly folk is where are we gonna put our cars? That was our parking lot. So for our design concept, we said, well, what if every single kiosk was based off the dimensions of a parking space? So this way they can still keep their cars parked while we also have the kiosk there in the exact same location. So we came up with this massive shade structure and these individual kiosks and notice we have to show this to the elderly vestry in order to get them to be convinced to do this project. So at first we showed them here are all of your cars. All of your cars are gone. And this is what it could be if you allow us to do this. So once we showed them this image of the shade structure, which would be solar powered with these individual kiosks, and the blue is a nod to the Bahamian flag, the actual wood that clads each of these kiosks would actually be done by the Bahamians that live there in the community because there's a history of basket weaving and wooden woven structures that are there in the Bahamas. So it's our way of bringing their history, telling their story as a part of the project. And so once they saw it, they were convinced because I don't know if you all get tired of going to farmer's market and you see those same white tents they're like the 10 by 10 that you get from Dick's Sporting Goods or whatever version of Dick's Sporting Goods exists in Toronto. Um, but yes, we were just so tired of those. We were like, why can't we just design our own kiosks as well? And these become the things that people work out of. So now we get to Griot. Griot was at the Venice Biennale. It ended a couple months ago. Um, and we started with Griot, if you recall, which is the West African storyteller. So we'll book in with Griot in a way of talking about stories that are often missing from architectural pedagogy. So we know these columns, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, Composite. We learn them in our foundational architecture courses. We know that Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian are Greek, and we know that Tuscan is Roman, and the Composite is Composite. But for some reason, when we learn these things, and I'm not sure if it's the same way here at University of Toronto, we skipped the fact that Egypt had columns before Greece had columns. And before Rome then took Greece's columns and then peddled them off as being the people who are more important in showing these things. So in my mind, I said, well, what if I came up with my own column order inspired by the people who I visit and see while I'm there at the American Academy in Rome? So students, I started by reading, open a book. And as I was going through these texts, I began to learn really interesting things like there was a different column instead of the Ionic that was called the Aeolic, which is a way cooler column. It's just, I don't know why the Ionic got chosen, but the Aeolic looks way better. But throughout this process, it's like, all right, here are the histories, here are the things I'm learning. Here are the rule sets of what it means to design a column after I read all those books. So then my goal was break every rule. Because again, if we're gonna talk about these things and I'm gonna come up with my own order, I can't do it the way that everybody else has already done it, right? I have to do it my own way. Hence why we call this columnar disorder. I thought it was catchy, maybe you don't, I thought it was. And so I wanted to be inspired by the things that I see on a regular basis, the things that inspire me, things like black hair, like really cool cornrows and braids and dreadlocks and these things that I mean, I don't know if you all know this, but if you're like a black American at some point in time, if you were born from 1980 to like 1990, you had braids. It was a thing. I blame the M1 mixtape, but you know, it happened. And so we designed this column. And that's not AI. So you people who are using Mid Journey, go design something. <laughs> and so we started with this giant block of Spanish Marquino marble. That thing is 10 feet long, five feet in each direction. The people that built it, they're called Cora Stone. They're based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, fun fact about Cora Stone, I sent them three emails, two Instagram DMs, and a call multiple times, and they never answered 
one time. I had to call a friend who works at the Cooper Hewitt to speak on my behalf and say, can you please answer Jermaine's call because they thought I was a nobody and they weren't gonna answer if I didn't have her answer on my behalf. But then once they did, they liked me and they said, sure, we'll do the project. So they had this on their lot and they took out this massive cylinder because the Venice Biennale told us our floor capacity is 6,000 pounds. And if you bring something greater than 6,000 pounds, it will collapse and people will get hurt and you will get sued. So we took out the core so that we can get the column down to 5,935 pounds. I'm not kidding. And they had this really cool diamond cutter. Yes, literally a diamond cutter that sliced it up and did all of the work. And you see it starting to take form. And then this is Eric. Eric finished everything else by hand. You see these glasses that are on his head? Those are AR glasses. And so he had our Rhino model that had the actual final column in real life over this uh, a giant slab of marble. And he's literally just using the hand tools to finish this entire thing with the AR glasses in front of him. And this is him finishing up the work. And you can start to see things like the hints of the corn rolls and the plaits in the actual project. And this is a close up of what it looked like. You can begin to see the textures. And one of the interesting things that we found was when we were doing the research on the columns, some of the earliest columns, even before you get to the papyrus orders of Egypt, were just stationary wood columns that were used in Africa. And so we wanted the marble to actually read as a texture of wood. And I would stand by the columns telling visitors, absolutely, you can touch it. And every time I said that, the curatorial staff for the Venice Biennale would yell at me and say, stop telling people to touch the column. Because if you tell them to touch your work, they'll touch other people's stuff too. But I felt like the whole purpose of it was to be touched, so whatever. And this is the column being finished. It is nine and a half feet tall, four and a half feet in diameter. Just for scale, I said it's nine and a half feet tall, so just think about how tall these columns are inside of Arsenale. And they had this brilliant lighting designer. I can take no credit for the cool way he lit it. It was this elderly Italian guy who rode a bicycle around the, the Arsenale. If you've ever been to Arsenale, it's like a half a mile long. So you understand why he had a bicycle. And he'd just ride up to the work. He'd look up at the, at like the people at the top level. He'd like do a couple pointing. They'd fix lights and he'd just ride on off as if he never existed. It was always the coolest thing, but he was so good that I thought this was a rendering. I was like, this isn't real, like that's not my project. They're like, no, this is literally your project. This is a photograph. And as I mentioned, this is columnar disorder. So the column that you just saw is called the identity column. We also came up with the migration and the labor columns. This is my triumvirate to counter Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. And that's because when I lived in Italy, one of the things I noticed is that many people who are from the African diaspora were always forced into these small little areas and always treated like second-class citizens. In the States, we have this thing called Uber Eats. There, they have a thing called Glovo. And Glovo was these big yellow backpacks and you always saw Africans wearing these things. And it was the only time you saw somebody that looked black in Rome or in Fiumicino and all these other locations. And so I just felt like this has to be something that speaks to the perseverance and the legacy of these people that are here so let's talk about migration, let's talk about identity, let's talk about labor. So this is the migration column inspired by water ripples and the forced movement of people from the African continent across the globe. This is the labor column, which references a bunch of actual crops and the way that, that slave labor was taken from Africa into Southeast, Southwest, all of the United States, and what it means to design around crops. And then because we're architects, uh, you know, we had to make sections and elevations and stuff because we wouldn't have been seen as real architects if we didn't. Thank you, Schumacher. Um, so like as a result, we came up with these drawings where we sort of flipped old Piranesi drawings. And on top of that, you start to see these little iconographies, right? Have any of you ever seen those Transformers movies? I mean, they're not very good movies, but they're interesting, right? And so you know the scene in the one where it's like Megatron's being experimented on and he's like in a big room and it's like that cell phone that's in your hand only happens because we did experiments on Megatron. 
So in my mind, I was like, what if I make drawings that made my column look like it predated the other columns that we typically see? And we sort of created this alternate reality of these columns came first, all the other columns that you know, the chunky column, the postmodern columns, they stole from this one. And that's my Megatron drawing. Well, that's all the people that's there. And then that text in the background, it's, it says identity, but it says identity in Berber. So when you do a lot of the research and you begin to understand what it means to be in North Africa, you start to learn what it meant to be an indigenous group, what it means to be Tunisian or Moroccan or Mauritanian, and how that was frowned upon when it came to understanding what it, uh, the actual movement of people. And the Berbers were actually looked at and looked down upon. And so I felt it was only right to actually utilize that language as a part of the drawing to then bring up the fact that a lot of this stuff doesn't exist without those people. And then, this is Howard University, one of the preeminent historically black colleges in the United States of America. And so I figured if we have these schools, why would I keep a Corinthian column on the front? Why would I not put my identity column there instead? So put blackness in the space that's for black people. And so these were all the drawings together. And then we came up with these really cool masks because when you go to a show, and you begin to see things that are from the African diaspora, you see masks, and then all of these columns were actually made from that giant uh, cylinder you all saw before, because we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint, so we try to use as much stuff as possible. And so this mask are futuristic uh, goggles that sort of looks like if you're on a boat and you don't know how to swim, like you need your goggles. Uh, this one here is, I'm not sure if you all have ever seen this image of young black man that's enslaved and they have a mask over his mouth while he's on the auction block. So it's that plus COVID mask, because unfortunately the communities that were hit hardest by COVID were a lot of the black and brown communities in the United States of America. So we talk about labor, we can't always talk about the good parts of labor. And in the end, we have the identity mask, which reveals only certain parts of your face, because unfortunately for most people of color or people of different genders, you can't be your full self in public space without somebody trying to give you a hard time. And so when you first walk into Arsenale, the very first exhibition you saw was mine, and this was the entire show all the way up into the, uh, into the column, the identity column. Okay, you ready, buddy? We're gonna make this work. Normally, I don't put any type of audio into things, but I tried something different today because I'm not in my country, and I'm in yours. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give you guys some audio. I have no idea if this is gonna work. If it doesn't, I'll have egg on my face. But if it does, my legend will grow. <laughs> all right, let's see. See, I don't even see it on the screen. <laughs> We're already off to a bad start. Yeah, it's not there. Okay, we came up with a backup. You came up with a backup, and I appreciate you for that. So here's what we're gonna do. Boom. Tom Flow is really a way for people to take a break and stop and have a great story in their life and interact. The first part is Mr. Drop, and that is the very last graphic color wonderful generic creature that you can sit in and rock back and forth. Roll with the black crystal ball, which operates at a level of close to a million foot. And last, Thank you. 
thank you. <laughs> Allie. How <laughs> Allie told me I had, her, I had a timer, so I wanted to make sure I did it without the timer. You, you only were asking about your time. <laughs> <laughs> How about your legend? <laughs> We'll see. Can I give you some water? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Jermaine. That was great. Uh, I'm try I got a few questions. Uh, one, one of the things that strike uh, one of the things that's interesting in your work is like you know I as I was reading all your descriptions, you know, before you came up here and then seeing it tonight, that. Uh, you know, like the forms of your work is kind of colorful, sometimes you might call it abstract, but it always seems like there's, well, you said it at the beginning, you know, sort of s stories, mm -hmm. that they always seem to have a kind of a symbolic purpose, a set of references. Um, I'm just wondering, do you, do you think that people, do you think people are seeing that when they, I mean, like I can, I can see in all the pictures people engaging in the work, do you think people are seeing some of those stories that you're, that you're telling yeah, about? Yeah. Um, if, if we go backwards, so the Rock Roll installation from 2022, a lot of people would tag me in it and say, this reminds me of Carnival without me actually having to say it. Because the moment they would sit within the structure, they would feel like they have on the regalia that you see when you go to, or when you see Juve and these other types of things. So um, certain things, is, I jokingly tell people my practice is, if you know, you know which means like I don't want to describe stuff. So like when people see the young girl getting her hair braided, like they get it and they immediately know what that means. They don't need an architecture degree to be able to understand those things. So it does take a lot of writing and references to make sure we have something that isn't making it, it isn't reducing the intellectual capacity. It's just making it more relatable, right? Like that's what our goal is, is how can we do this so that people who don't have an architecture background still understand the spatial component of the work um, without making them feel bad for not being architects or for being urbanists, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I, uh, you didn't show it tonight, but one of the one of your projects, you did those designs for chairs. Yep. Because you yeah, said porch is one of your themes. And then you're struck by the way in which uh, the forms, you know, you could experience them as just abstract, but they're always, it's colorful, so it's always kind of playful, but playful and abstract, but there's always a kind of, uh, I guess, like iconography of kind of significance. Yeah, I think, I think that goes to, um, I like things that are identifiable, yeah. things that immediately evoke memory. Again, we're going back to this idea of griot and, and verbal narratives and sort of oral histories. There's always like the one component everybody remembers. It's maybe the large green pan that every family has, or maybe it's the couch that has the plastic on it, or maybe it's the blanket that has a bunch of floral arrangements. They're like every single family has this thing. And so if that's the, if that's the starting point, then I can manipulate that using architecture and design into something that's new, but still has that reference. And so the actual reference for MoMA was the Ebony Test Kitchen because Ebony had did this amazingly beautiful kitchen with paisley patterns on the outside. I think it was just acquired uh, by some institution. And so when I was approached, I told the curatorials team, I don't wanna make a single drawing. I just wanna make my own version of the Ebony Test Kitchen so that when people go downstairs to this Ebony, they can come upstairs to mine and they go upstairs one more floor, they'll go to this historic kitchen, which is like one of the most innovative things you saw back in the 1930s. And then COVID happened. And they said, Jermaine, you have to reduce the scale because if things are too big, we'd have a line of people and we can't have people within six feet of each other. So that's why the full kitchen became a spice rack. But because I'm black, it's like we have eight different types of salt. It's not a spice rack, it's a spice wall. <laughs> so that's how, that's, that's why it became a wall instead. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I just, you know, that it's interesting. I, I kind of think uh, for people who, my generation, you know, we went to school, uh, what shall I say, give it away, but you know, in the <laughs> 80s, all, all uh, and postmodernism was kind of, maybe it was kind of on the ebb <laughs> at that time, but I mean, I think in, in the ne next generation reacts against all that kind of, uh, what they think is like the kind of artifice of symbolism. And I think that one of the things I, 
was really enjoying about your work is the kind of mingling of you know, these symbolic efforts and playful abstract form and they seem to they seem to mingle seamlessly without effort without problems oh there's a lot of effort well <laughs> no no i mean uh, yes <laughs> i don't mean your effort there's always yeah. effort behind all design but yeah yeah no, but you make it seem that way. You know, you want it to seem, you don't want the others to feel your Yeah, yeah, you never want anybody to know the secret recipe, right? You just <laughs> want them to see the end and be like, wow, how did that happen? Yeah. Um, and, and I can honestly say a lot of it really happens from us just joking around in the studio. Yeah. Like, what if we made chairs that look like hair picks? And then somebody says, all right, let's try it. And then we literally try to do those things. So we just throw things off the wall. And then if we can make it, then we do it. So also to students, when your professors tell you to make models or to draw the stuff, they're saying that for a real reason, because if it stays in the computer, you have no idea how gravity reacts with it. So when we do stuff, we literally, we make everything. We do mock-ups of every single thing that we do internally. We have so much scrap. Like there's chair pick head all over the place. There's old discarded wrappings that were the ones for the uh, labels that we didn't like. Like all the stuff we do, we do internally, mm -hmm. and then the world sees the one that we like the best. But we always go through this iterative process of like five, six, seven, 15, 20, right. before we get to a point where we're actually happy with it. Uh, I'm gonna uh, give the audience a chance to ask sure. some questions too. So I, anybody have questions out there? There must be. Uh, thank you for the lecture and uh, firstly I mean I love your brave expression and uh, my question is in your uh, projects what is the role of community like um, what's the role of community engagement in in the whole process so as to like as a designer do you design the space and then you see how the community or people are reacting to it no uh, <laughs> yeah. no so we, we Man, the amount of time we spend having a feedback loop with the community, that's, our, that's an entire phase. Like typically we know programming, schematic, design development, et cetera, but for us, after programming, we get to the community stage and that community stage informs the schematic stage. So for example, the Delray Beach project you saw, the amount of times I had to go back to convince this church population that it was okay to have a glass storefront because they said to me, we want more glass. Now, if you want more glass, here's a storefront. Well, that seems expensive. You asked for it. <laughs> this is the thing that you wanted on the building. And that's when you begin to understand that for a lot of communities that are sometimes under-resourced, there's this inherent desire to stop what they see as frivolous spending. Because the money that's going to a glass facade can go towards a social program that somebody in the community needs that might be even more important than having the glass. And then that's when I learned, oh, the best way to get my point across is to explain to them, you deserve nice things in your neighborhood as well. You shouldn't have to leave your neighborhood to go somewhere else. And then when you get there, complain about the fact that this isn't in your neighborhood. And so it's an entire feedback loop and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth before we get to a point where we're like, all right, we now have approval, we can keep going. For any community project we work on, we do not immediately jump into design without having intense conversations with local stakeholders and community leaders. And most time that means we have to be there at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. because that's when they get off work. Or it means we have to give up a weekend because everybody's working Monday through Friday. These are the sacrifices that go into doing community oriented work. Um, and the other thing nobody ever tells you, it takes a long damn time. Like it's not a quick process where it's 18 months, 24 months. We've been doing this project for two and a half years. Nothing's built yet. We just got to 15% DD. And I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed that at our next construction meeting on Monday, we can continue going forward because all it takes is one person that wasn't at a meeting the week before to come back and say, well, why is the bathroom there? And the next thing you know, you're trying to convince somebody about why you're an architect, so. You're welcome. Um, you mentioned, perhaps this is a longer, too, too long an answer for you, but um, in the video you mentioned that um, the city of Miami has allowed your practice to flourish 
mm -hmm. design practice. And um, it, it, could you talk a bit more about your journey there and how you got it? Sure. So um, Miami is a very young city. I don't know how many of you all know, Miami is only like 105 years old. Like it's an extremely, extremely young city. There's people, humans that are just as old as Miami. And so for many people, like nobody sees Miami as a destination of practice. They see Miami as a destination of recreation. And so many people leave Miami to go to New York, go to LA, go to Chicago, go to these other big cities to be the lead designers. There's a consistent brain drain there all the time. And so when I moved there, I felt like I was a, I felt like there were just so many opportunities because there just wasn't that many people there yet. And so it allowed me to skip quite a few lines that if I had stayed in Los Angeles or stayed in Chicago, I would probably just be getting to a certain point. And so I had to make the conscious decision, all right, do I stay in Miami or do I leave and see if I'm actually talented or not? Because there's an the issue of like the big fish in a small pond versus the other way, right? And I was like, well, if my career has done this well in Miami, why would I be stupid to leave? Why do I need to test myself in New York or Chicago and go through this unnecessary hazing where things are great and it's 85 degrees all the time? <laughs> so I stayed there instead. And at a certain point, the larger global architecture community began to take focus and see the stuff that was going on. And it put me on the same platform as all of my contemporaries in those other cities. And when that happened, I really had no reason to leave at that point. And then they all start coming to Miami, like how do I get the next Lexus project? Or how do I get this next thing? And so it was really interesting in the way that that happened. And I absolutely know that if I had stayed in Chicago, Los Angeles, the speed of this would have never happened at the, at the rate that it happened. I'm well aware of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for an inspiring presentation. Uh, you were talking about making at the scale of like a drawing and model, so I was wondering if you enjoy the process between the renderings and the fabrication. Like I was wondering, especially for your Spain project, because I guess it makes sense if you have a fabricator who's like really local and you're friends with. And I was wondering how you found them in Spain and if you're like friends with them <laughs> and if that was like a positive process at all. Because, uh, yeah, it was really cool to see um, the jump from the render to the image with the light and shadow and stuff. So um, I'll give you all a tiny peek behind the curtain. A lot of the renderings we do are after we've already finished the project. Like, we sketch a lot. My architecture education was based on everything by hand. So for four years... All I did was draw stuff by hand. So in our studio, if you can't draw it, it doesn't exist. So sometimes my assistants are like, gee, what if we do this? I'm like, can you sketch it, please? No, I can't sketch it, then don't talk to me. Figure out how to sketch it, figure out how to draw it, and then we can have a conversation about it. And so we do that, and once we finish iterating, then we just start building. We just start making models. We just start figuring out how to make stuff at scale. We do small little prototyping of just portions of it to see if it actually makes sense at that color palette. Um, we have remnants of the chairs in the studio. And so when we got so good at that, it made it easier for us to talk with fabricators because everybody on the team understands connections and details before we even get to the fabricator. So when they ask us a question, we are already ready. We need number eight bolts, just do them like this. We need this type of weld, do this, because that's how we work in the studio. So the project in Spain, they have their own fabricators. And all of that prep work helped us so that when it was time for us to communicate with those fabricators, we had a full set of construction documents already ready for them. Because a lot of times, if you all know, a contractor will tell you how to put your building together because you're not in charge of construction means and methods. They'll tell you, I'm gonna do it like this. And it may not end up the way you wanted it to end up. So the more information you can give, the better. Now the Lexus project was the most fun project because those fabricators were based out of Portland and they were like, hey, we've never done anything like this, but it seems really cool. So how about you just fly out to Portland and we figure this thing out together? And so that's what we did. Like we went out to Portland and we were like, all right, what if we use this type of rod? What if we use lights in this type of way? Uh, we do a very hands-on process because again, that's the way I was taught. And that's the way I was taught architecture was supposed to be. You do everything from the large scale all the way down to the detail. And so that's the way we run the practice. Oh yeah, that's really helpful, thanks. Hi there. 
Uh, you touched on this, this issue a little bit in your talk, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about the sort of hybridization of culture, especially in diasporatic communities, and how that sort of shifts as it moves across water or across the country or across the neighborhood or across the city, and how that sort of informs your work as well at working in these communities. Yeah, so um, yesterday I did a talk in Professor Richard Summers' class, and uh, I made sure not to show anything that I showed today, yesterday, so the students would have to come today. <laughs> and, but, but one thing I did show was actually a bunch of the research that I did on porches, and specifically showing how that space came from West Africa as the combat, all the way through Haiti as the TK because of enslavement, and then into Southeast US as the shotgun home, and how, depending on where you are, this thing gets manipulated, and the rituals of that space get changed as well as it becomes a shotgun home to a Greystone in Chicago or a double wide in Detroit. And so I think for me, migration is super interesting because it shows how resilient people are and how clever and innovative they are. Because you're able to take this exact same space, the very generic porch, but you manipulate it into a way that allows for it to only make sense in DC or only to make sense in Atlanta or only to make sense in Houston in that machination. And so even though I didn't show it, some of the other stuff I did show was how for instance, rock roll, that the Bahamian and Jamaican community there really do embrace the city as a space for play, but also bright, colorful, loud, so much sound. And that's why the rent chimes were so important. And trust me, a lot of those very expensive brands, because they was right there in the Zion District, which is nothing but LVMH and all those type of places, they were pissed. <laughs> because it was just so much commotion. All it takes is one gust of wind, and the entire design district just would super loud because every single wind chime would go at the exact same time. They were not happy with me at all. But I feel like I run really fast. So like, <laughs> you just gotta catch me. So I think with a lot of these things, that's the way that we try to do is like, how do we bring in the narrative of people and places and don't appropriate? And that's the, the, the clever part, right? Like with a lot of this work, I always make clear to say, I am not Caribbean. I'm regular black in the US. And I say that because I don't want anyone else to feel like, well, he's adopting our culture. Like, I am not. But I also know that there's so many overlaps in our culture, hence the food project from MoMA. And these are the commonalities that we have, so I'm gonna celebrate these things. But I don't give away every single secret because you don't want it to be commodified. And that's why it remains, if you know, you know. Thanks. Just, uh, uh, what about the fact that you're, you're a Chicago and down in Miami? You ever feel like uh, you're a visitor you still feel like a visitor there? You yeah, like big absolutely. Differences? I still feel like a visitor there because everywhere I go, I just want to get some good soul food. It's so impossible to get. Like, you just want to go get some really good candy yams and collard greens, and it's so bad because it's just not the, the food of some of these other places. And so you get Jamaicans who just make really, really bad macaroni and cheese, and you're just like, this is, just, this is blasphemy. But there's not much, <laughs> but there's not much you can do about it. But I will say this, um, Michael Jordan has his number retired at the Miami Heat Stadium. So every time I go, I poke fun at the fact that your franchise retired our best player's number. So whatever you want to say about me not being here, we own you. <laughs> hey, Jermaine, that was a really inspiring talk. Um, Thank you. When, you were, when you were talking about uh, your community engagement, um, it sounds like ethnography, like as a part of a design process where you're mining for um, ideas. I was wondering how you deal with uh, conflict resolution, where you have um, someone who says, this is absolutely important to me, and, and you have another group that uh, absolutely disagrees. How do, you, how do you navigate that within a community? Ah, okay, so great question. Again, I feel like a lot of you might have overheard the lecture from yesterday, and it brought a lot of the questions. Did you put plants? in the crowd, Richard. <laughs> um, so I did not show a project that we were just awarded, and that project is in Dallas, Texas. And it's called the Fred Rouse Center for Community Healing. Um, it was a former KKK headquarters that then became a pecan factory that is now derelict. And a coalition of community groups, um, LGBTQIA+, young people, black churches, created a nonprofit, purchased this property, and did a search for a design architect, an international search. 
my team won. And so it'll be our first cultural project. I think it's like a $40 million project. And one of the biggest things is one part of the community says burn that damn thing down. Like it's, a, it's a relic of a time that still exists even though it's covert. And it's a reminder of all the harm that has been done to blacks and Jews and Mexicans in that community. And there's the other side that says don't burn it down because if we remove it, then how do we prove to people that this thing existed? How do we prove to people that we have to not repeat the same unfortunate histories over and over and over again? And so as the design architects, we find ourselves in the middle, half the community says burn it down, the other half says keep it. So in that case, we end up negotiating a lot between both types of groups that oppose each other, and we use a consensus model. Consensus models take a long time because everybody gets a chance to express how they feel as opposed to like the fake democratic model of this just vote or the two thirds model of majority vote. So after consensus, we say, well, what if we just tear down most of it? So that way those don't see the same version. And then what if we do this thing where we reconstitute the materials, what we torn down, and these become things that you can step on or dance on or things that show that you're liberating or that you're joyful at the expense of this horrific history. And so that's why the community engagement part is its own phase for us, because for a lot of projects we do, there's a lot of people who have been mistreated or had a lot of promises that were broken. And a lot of times we're just therapists, like we're not even architects. And that's why I jokingly told Richard yesterday, I always call myself an architectural anthropologist, not an architect, because there's so much things we have to do just speaking to people and understanding their history and their story. And then once you do that and you meet a person on an eye to eye level, they're more inclined to put trust in you. But if you talk down at people and you say, I'm the expert, I know everything there is to know, you don't know anything, it's not going to go well, especially when I'm not from Fort Worth, Texas. All I know is barbecue. Like, I don't know anything else about Texas, but the people that are there know this history. And so we empower them and they empower us and that reciprocal relationship typically bears fruit. Again, we're just into the schematic design phase, so I'm not past that or anything, but hopefully it continues to go well. I'm just curious, I mean, because you're, you're, you're kind of navigating the different points of view about that very tricky topic, but it's a topic which is, you know, it's um, relevant for a lot of other monuments, like all the Confederate mm -hmm. statues. And, and, you know, we have, I mean, the history of uh, residential schools in Canada, renaming institutions and things of, like, of that sort. And um, I'm just wondering what you, your own thoughts are about this question of uh, preservation or demolition because when you enter into that conversation, obviously you're trying to sound out the different constituencies or mm -hmm. pers points of view, really. But you also must bring you bring something to it yourself. Yeah, um, preservation is difficult. Like, I hate the idea of preservation because it's just who has the most time to write a whole bunch of pieces of paper. Like, that's what preservation really comes down to. Do you have enough time to fill out a 100-page document? that says that something is historically relevant and submit it to somebody that's full of arbitrary people who get to decide if they find it relevant or not. And so in that sense, I'm not a fan. But I also understand that there are things that exist in the built environment that whether you give them significance or not become monuments. So like in Chicago, you'll see this teddy bear on a tree. And if you see that teddy bear, that means somebody died right there and that becomes the monument. If you're in Chicago and you know the story of Emmett Till, you know that house when you go by. That's a lot different than erecting a statue to Christopher Columbus, who was a moron. So like, and, and that way is like, I'm always interested in, in the things that people hold dear and like why they put certain things on pedestals. Um, but you have to understand that anytime you erect something to someone, you're gonna offend somebody, whether it's positive or negative, because everybody loves to complain. It's like the episode of The Simpsons when they're at the thing and the guy just keeps yelling. It's like, why are you yelling? Because I want to. And it's like, that's what it is. It's like people just enjoy yelling. So if you get past that first hurdle, you're able to understand that certain things exist not because it's worth a damn, but because that person persevered long enough through all the community meetings of yelling and then their paperwork got stamped and this other paperwork did not get stamped because that person got tired of that process. So we're doing a lot of work on monuments um, right now in East Germany 
and we're trying to understand what that means as well. Materials, labor, informal versus formal. Um, so like we're always trying to weave different things together. Um, as you all can see, I try to do a whole lot of different types of things because I get bored very quickly and then when I get bored, I jump to like, hey, let's make a movie. And then we made a movie and it's like, I didn't show the movie, but it's like seven minutes long, but then we made a movie. And it actually won some awards, which is like, which is crazy. And it's like, hey, let's go design some chairs. All right, we're done with chairs. Let's go design some swings. We're done with swings. Let's go design a car. We're done with car. So we're always just trying to find different stuff to do and like do through this entire process. It just, it keeps us happy. It keeps us engaged. It keeps us um, rigorous. Uh, it keeps us intense. Um, but I think these are all the things that architecture and design allow us to do. Well, you did say something else about preservation too. You know, you were, you were distinguishing, I, I, guess, I think you were making a distinction between the preservation of buildings, not necessarily monuments, but just, you know, historical architectural materials, mm -hmm. because they're old, maybe they're sometimes good, not always, mm -hmm. uh, versus preservation of, like, uh, I, I guess, it, you know, built uh, social environments. Yep. And, you know, you also referred to the way in which highways have demolished them. So preservation also has this other valence, I think, in your... Oh, thinking. absolutely. And I think, for me, the most important thing is preservation of culture. Like, that's the stuff that I'm most interested in. So if that culture means that tree that's over there that everybody has their stool by because that's the important tree and everybody knows you do not move those chairs, then to me, that's the culture that we have to preserve. Or if it's the, the wall that we showed that everybody sits along and they call it the pork and beans, like that's the thing that we wanna preserve. Um, but again, you get into these issues of who is it for? Who does it push back against? Who's happy about it? Who's not happy about it? But at its core, it's always for us about celebrating the culture of people, celebrating the histories of people, celebrating the joy of people because so much of this stuff is always built on trauma and I just get tired of being just flooded with trauma. Like the world is a very crappy place. So if I can put just a little bit of sprinkle of color in the thing just to make you distracted for a little bit of time, and that's all it is, is a distraction, and I feel like I've done my job. I don't know if you've noticed in Toronto, but we have a particular regime of preservation. We have a lot of towers going up. You know, I think the second most after Mexico City in North America, not the most mm. towers, but the most going up. Yeah. And uh, almost all of them seem to stand on top of a two or three story building, usually a Victorian piece of commercial architecture sometimes a house. Every single tower stands on top of a house. <laughs> you gotta love how this stuff works. I mean, it's, buildings are buildings. I told this to the students yesterday, like, they exist, hooray. <laughs> After that, it's like, let's, let's keep going to the next thing. Yeah, that would be nice sometimes. <laughs> You got one there. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was incredible and really inspiring. Um, I in particularly want to bring back to, I guess, also related to preservation, but uh, you mentioned a lot of the historically black neighborhoods in Miami that have been, you know, facing a lot of pressure from white uh, people who are trying to rebuy or buy up these neighborhoods, and that transfers pretty directly to Canada in a lot of ways. A lot of our black historic neighborhoods are also under this exact same kind of like white threat of gentrification. And in particular, uh, there's been a lot of organizing around the kind of like community land trust model. A lot mm -hmm. of black led community land trust models are uh, working on preserving those cultural spaces and keeping them in, in the ownership of, of black folks. Um, but this has been really focused on like housing and affordable housing and the housing crisis. And I just was, you work with such playful and beautifully uh, community, communal spaces and, and projects. I was wondering if you could speak to the kind of the balance of maybe an urgent need of housing versus actual spaces that uh, mean more for a kind of communal uh, group of people. So we, we unfortunately have not had the opportunity to do a housing project uh, just because in the States, housing is extremely expensive and most developers don't want to give up their developer's fee for affordable or workforce housing. Instead, they'll just continue to do luxury housing because it fills their bottom line. Um, I wish we'd get the opportunity to do a project like that just because they're so necessary. I don't know if you all know this, but like Miami is now the most unaffordable city to live in in the entire United States because our housing, a single family, I mean, a one bedroom apartment, I think is about $2,300 a month. 
but the average income is less than $30,000 a year. So like, you literally cannot afford to live there and wages have not gone up. And, she, and Florida is not a place that's rent controlled. So literally every single time your lease is up, your landlord can raise it as much as they want to at their discretion, which is insane. You can go from 1700 a month to 27 the next year and there's nothing you can do about it except move out. So I'm always interested in alternative models of housing like community land trusts, um, co-ops and things of this nature because there has to be some sort of solution. But in a place like Florida where the laws are the laws and the leadership is the leadership, like I don't fortunately see any type of change in how that can happen. And so that's why we focus on the communal spaces as well because many people who can't afford housing still need somewhere to be. So we've been trying to do this thing where we get a bunch of the churches in Delray Beach to, play, to plant fruit trees so that the unhoused literally have access to food. And the first thing they said was no. And we're like, why? They're like, because we don't want them to eat off the trees. I was like, ain't that the point? It's like the literal point, because you're a church, is to help people. So if we plant, some gumbo limbos for shade, we plant some avocado trees, we plant some different type of mango trees. And I actually had these type of slides, but I took them out because the thing would have been like 130 slides if I kept them all in. <laughs> but we've literally we convinced them to plant a bunch of trees. We're like, we guilt trip the hell out of them. <laughs> We're like, you said you're a church, you're supposed to help people. If we don't plant these trees, who are you helping? And it worked. So we were able to get a bunch of trees that were actually gonna plant it, but it's not easy to get people to wanna do that. It's not easy to get people to want to do it. And there's not enough nurseries that are willing to donate these type of stocks of stuff to put there. Or people just hoard them for themselves. People are planting a mango tree and won't let anybody get access to it. And so we just try to find small interventions where we can insert ourselves because, again, we can't change all of policy no matter how much we try. And we do get some little wins, but the big ones like developer fees or the way that we do tax market credits and these other type of stuff, it's just it's far beyond the state level. That's the federal level. Um, so with all of that stuff, we have to find ways to get people to be excited about things, and we do it with parks, we do it with buildings, we do it with little stuff like that, because those are temporary fixes until we can get to the larger thing of the housing model. So with the Delray Beach, hopefully we'll finish this damn building and the Bahamian market by the end of this year, and then once, no, middle of next year, and then once those things are done, we can move on to the housing component that we're also trying to do for them as well. So keep your fingers crossed. All right, I think uh, we'll call it a night. I want to thank you so much for come up, coming thank up you. here. It's great to have you. I'm, I'm glad Toronto reminded you, to have sh reminded you of Chicago. I'm sorry it wasn't as cold. You were complaining it wasn't cold enough. <laughs> come, come again, I promise it gets colder. Anyway, before everybody goes, let me just say a few things. Uh, I want to remind you that we have in our public programming series next Thursday night, urban planner Chalina Odbert of Co Conquoi, Conquoi Design Initiative, and she will speak on the subject of design and the just, and the just public realm. Uh, her talk will take place here in Main Hall at 6.30 p.m. on February 8th. Um, and as I noted, uh, Jermaine's lecture was the first event in our Black History, Black Futures Month series of offerings. So. On February 15th, architect uh, Khalise, Khalise, Khalise Lay, uh, D. Lee Wai, oh my goodness, <laughs> uh, D. Lee Wayo will be here to talk about his Black Diaspora's project, a community-led mapping initiative that examines the experiences, spaces, and places having meaning to black people. And I urge you to all check out the display in our library as well as our art installation in the historic stairwell between the second and third floors on the south side of the Daniels building here. So I invite you all to join us uh, in the commons. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much.